All right, team, you ready for video number 10 or X if you like Roman numerals? I think that's right. All right, anyway, <laughs> I can never figure out the Super Bowls. What's L? All right, we are ultimately trying to connect equilibrium and thermodynamics. There's a way to connect uh, connect kinetics into that as well, but I'm, I'm probably gonna skip that. It's a little minor intrusion, but we're gonna try to integrate thermodynamics and equilibrium here, and this is the video that does it, hoo hoo! Delta G and equilibrium. <clears throat> Remember, delta G, any temperature, any condition, standard, non-standard, doesn't matter. All we do is take our standard Gibbs free energy and adjust it with some correction factor. Of course, if you're in standard conditions, you don't need to do any of that. You can just calculate it. So we're in non-standard conditions. What I want you to think about is, you know, remember with Q, that's for non-equilibrium uh, partial pressures or, or molarities. What if we are at equilibrium? Oh, so think about this, all right? So when we're at equilibrium, two of these things will change. What is the value for the Gibbs energy change at equilibrium? Remember, if it's spontaneous in the forward direction and it wants to go more towards products, it's negative. If it's spontaneous in the reverse direction and it wants to form more reactants, it's positive. But when we're at equilibrium, there's no driving force either direction. It's in its happy place. Delta G is zero. Mm. Not delta G not. Remember, delta G not is that specified reference conditions. One atmosphere or one bar pressure, concentrations are one molar, technically an activity of one. So that's a lot more restrictive. All right, so delta G is zero at equilibrium. But what else changes? Remember, Q is the reaction quotient at non-equilibrium uh, concentrations or partial pressures. But at equilibrium, Q is equal to the equilibrium constant. Hey, can we do some algebraic substitutions? I love algebraic substitutions. Let's put in a value of zero for this and a value of K for that and get another one of the kinkahuna, kind of the top three thermodynamic equations. This is one of them. This next one is gonna be critical because it's gonna relate thermodynamics to equilibrium directly, All right? So let's bring this down. That's going to have a value of zero. Bring delta G naught. That doesn't change, right? Whether you're at equilibrium or not. Plus R and T. Those are just best. It doesn't matter what temperature you're at. Equilibrium has nothing to do with temperature in the scenario, but we are going to find out the third of the top three equations. Here's one, here's two. The third one is going to be in the next uh, focus and how we're going to end this chapter is how is the equilibrium constant dependent on temperature Temp or as i had in uh my graduate college one of my professors would go temperature temperature it's the only thing i remember from graduate level thermo <laughs> right a lot of the stuff you just learn on your own when you need it later plus rt log k so now if that's zero can i just pull this to the other side Right, um, so delta G will just be equal to negative RT log K. That's it. So Gibbs free energy change at standard conditions is equal to the negative because you're moving that to the other side. Gas constant times temperature log of the equilibrium constant. So this connects thermodynamics to equilibrium. That is huge. So it connects thermo to equilibrium. And again, I would consider that one of the top three. You got that one, and you got that one. Pretty simple to derive this one from that one, right? Just Q is K and delta G is zero. Easy peasy. The great, one of the most common things for this type of problem is to be able to calculate theoretically equilibrium constant values from thermodynamic tables, right? Because we could calculate those, whether it's at 25 degrees Celsius, which is easy. If it's not 25 degrees Celsius, not so easy, but doable. We can calculate those theoretically using thermodynamic tables. As long as we have a specified temperature, and R, we can calculate K. Ooh, ooh. 
So we can calculate equilibrium constants. And I'm running out of board space. But that's one of the focuses of this video. Taking thermodynamic data from tables that are handed out to you uh, and calculating equilibrium constants. <gasps> Let's go do it. All right, here's a type, a very, very common type of problem. There's really only two ways we can go, but here's the most common way. So we got a reaction. It doesn't matter. We got some reaction in equilibrium. So we got some Fe3O4 solid plus four moles of diatomic hydrogen gas, giving us three moles of iron solid plus four moles of water vapor. Remember, it makes a difference if water's a liquid or a gas because those are different numbers on the thermodynamic tables. <laughs> Include your states. Determine the equilibrium constant at 25.0 degrees Celsius. And you go, hallelujah, we love it when it's at 25.0 degrees Celsius because delta G naught is very easy to calculate in one step. If it's not at 25 degrees Celsius, it sucks, but can't be done, all right? Because you'd have to get delta H naught, delta S naught, calculate delta G naught, like we did in one of the prior videos. So it's like a four-step process. But So delta G naught can be done in one step if you're at 25 degrees Celsius or 298.15 Kelvin. It can be done in four steps if you're not at 25 degrees Celsius, okay? So let's calculate in step one. You can see I like steps. If you know the steps, it doesn't matter. I can give you thousands of different types of problems. It's the same thing every time. Use the thermodynamic tables to calculate the standard Gibbs free energy change for that reaction at 25.0 degrees Celsius. And then step two, we'll know this. We know R. We know the temperature. Isolate, solve for log of K, and then go E to that power, right? And we'll have our equilibrium constant values. Nice! We'll talk about what it means after we do the problem. I'm going to do a problem first, and then we'll kind of polish this off by looking at some graphs and go, what does it mean when, you know, delta G naught, small or big, negative or positive? How does that relate to equilibrium constant and whether you have a product favored or reactant favored, you know, uh, system at, uh, at equilibrium, right? Is it mostly products, mostly reactants? roughly equal mixtures of both, you can determine this based on the K value and the delta G naught value. All right, do this for me. Pause the video real quick. Solve for delta G naught. That should be cakewalk for you guys at this point. And then if you feel uh, game, go ahead and solve for K. See if you get what I get. Let me grab my thermodynamic tables. All right, did you get your Gibbs free energy of formation at standard conditions? And again, it's at 25.0 degrees Celsius, so we can just use these thermodynamic tables directly. Temperature, you always want to know what temperature you're at, because if you're not at 25 degrees Celsius, it complicates it. It's doable, but it complicates it. And you'll see that even more when we get to temperature dependency. Okay, so here's our equation. Um, seen that before, right? Same for delta H, same for delta S, all, all the same. So we're going to take the stoichiometric coefficients times the Gibbs energy of formation for our products minus the sum of the stoichiometric coefficients times the Gibbs free energy formation for our reactants. All right, so we've got a three in front of our a solid iron. So it's gonna be three times whatever the value is on our table. Plus, we've got a four in front of the water vapor. So we're gonna take four times whatever H2O gas is on our table. Put that in brackets. That's our products, our final state. Subtract from that. We got a coefficient of one on the Fe3O4 solid, so one times whatever its value is on the table, plus four, we got a coefficient of four in front of the hydrogen gas times whatever the Gibbs energy of formation is for hydrogen gas. Now, hopefully you got your thinking caps on. Hydrogen gas is an element at the standard states. Um, iron is an element. Um, if you're if you're doing the formation of it from the element in the standard states, its delta G formation will be zero. Okay, so the value for the hydrogen gas should be zero. The value for the iron solid should be zero. You don't even need to look on your table for that. Just pop a zero in there. But let's do it. So we got three times zero for the solid iron plus four times whatever water vapor is. So let's look up. Remember, we're in the second column. All right, second column is the Gibbs energy of formation. Uh, where's water vapor? Do you see here's liquid water? and gas phase water. So we want the gas phase water. If we go across to the second column, negative 237 point, nope, oh, I got the wrong one. Ah, I was looking at the liquid. <laughs> so the gas is negative 228.6. Like I said, I commonly go over and then go down one with my eyeballs. So gas phase water is negative 228.6. 228.6. 
that's a real common screw up. You're like I said, you're looking across the table and your eyes go and then you go down one or you do liquid water instead of gas tape. So four times 228.6 takes care of our products. Minus one times our Fe304. So let's look under iron. Notice iron solid. Iron solid is zero, no big surprise there. You see Fe304 on there? That's a weird one, isn't it? Right down there, Fe304. That is negative 1,015 kilojoules per mole. Negative 1,015 kilojoules per mole. That's why I have that value there. And then we have four times hydrogen, which is zero. I'm not even gonna show you the table. H2 gas, if you look it up, the delta G formation is nothing, not a goose egg, zilch, squat. Diddly squat. Let's do these brackets. Let's say that's gone. So four times negative 228.6, good to one decimal. It's negative 914.4 kilojoules per mole. That's for our products, our final state. One times negative 1,015 plus zero is negative 1,015 kilojoules per mole. We're going to subtract these, so we're limited by largest absolute uncertainty. This is good to the tenths place. That's good to the ones place, so the largest absolute certainty is to the ones place. You can't really go fewest decimal places on this one, so you really need to go with the official statistical version of uncertainty when you're adding or subtracting or taking averages. You're limited by the largest absolute uncertainty. So our answer will be 100.60 kilojoules per mole. Good to the ones place. That's why I put the dashed line uh, at 100.6. So that would round to 101, but I'm not going to round that because I did not ask for this. So why would you round and box something if it haven't been asked for it? We're solving for the equilibrium constant, right? So I'm going to round and box that one. All right, step one is done. Now do step two. Let's plug this into our really cool equation and solve for the equilibrium constant. All right, did you do it? I haven't. I didn't do it. I got too excited. All right, I left the equation on the board. We don't, don't really need the equation anymore. That's not important. But step two, we have our Gibbs energy uh, for the reaction at standard conditions. Let's plug it into this equation for equilibrium. We know the Gibbs energy of formation of standard conditions. R is a constant I provide for you on exams. Temperature was provided for us at 25.0 degrees Celsius. Solve for K, baby. Let's do our temperature first. Oh, you never have to show me that. It's pretty easy to do, but we know the temperature in Kelvin is just our temperature in degrees Celsius plus 273.15, which is exact, limited to the tenths place. So that'll be 298.150 Kelvin. We always need the Kelvin temperature in the absolute scale because R has joules per mole Kelvin, right? So we got it, and you never need to show me that temperature conversion, but make sure you track your uncertainty. Sometimes that temperature uncertainty uh, will limit your overall uncertainty for the problem. Sometimes, not always, but sometimes. Typically, equilibrium constants have very, if you look, remember from all of those Ka, Kb, Ksp, Kf tables, most of the equilibrium constants had one significant digit, maybe two. I don't think I saw any with more than two. All right, here we go. Uh, what do we got? We're isolating this. So let's solve for log of k first. All right? So log of k will be equal to delta g naught over rt. And then I'm going to bring, so I'm bringing, I'm dividing both sides by rt. And let's bring the negative sign over. My biggest mistake, I forget the negative sign. Cognition argue. All right, and then you're only off by like several hundred billion on your final answer of K. <laughs> delta G naught divided by RT, bring the negative sign over. Let's do it. We know delta G from the last problem was like 100 something, 100.6. Negative, negative. Was it? No, no, it was positive. I should probably just look at notes or something. So it was positive, right? It was positive 100.6, good to the ones place. So that was 100.60 kilojoules. Per mole. So delta G was positive, but see that negative sign comes from the equation. So let's stick that negative sign in front. All right. It makes a big difference if your delta G is positive or negative here. We're dividing by R, so we're going to have the 8.3145 joules per mole Kelvin. Kilojoules and joules don't cancel. You see, we do that quite a bit, right? So let's convert that. 
So let's go 1,000 joules per kilojoule. That's an ugly looking parentheses. Running out of board space. I need to divide by the temperature. Um, to keep it in a unit line equation, when you divide by something, you go one over. So let's go one over the temperature. That's going to be really squished, okay? So 298.15, 298.1, good to the tenths place, 50. Oh, 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 Kelvin. Kelvin. All right, hopefully your notes look better than mine. I just need a, like a six foot wide board. That would be nice. But hey, I didn't have much time to prepare for all this crazy shutdown stuff. So I'm lucky I even had this board laying around the house. <laughs> so we've got uh, delta G, 100.60 kilojoules per mole, divided by R, convert joules to kilojoules, divide by the temperature in Kelvin, put that negative sign there. Let's look at our units. All right, we've got moles canceling out there. We've got Kelvin. You can't really see my Kelvin over there. This Kelvin cancels out that Kelvin. That's why it's got to be in Kelvin. What else have we got? Joule, kilojoules cancels kilojoules, and joules cancels joules. We have no units left. But that's what's supposed to happen because we're taking a logarithm, right? So <laughs> you have no units in there. That should pan out. So log of K... That's going to be three significant digits, a lot, exact, four. So we're going to be limited to three significant digits in here. So I get negative 40.5, vertical dash line, 81. That's the log of K, negative 40.581. No units. All right. Almost done, gang. Now, to get K, we just take E to both sides. Remember, E to the natural log cancels out as one. It just leaves us as K. And so we'll have k is e to the negative 40.581. So k is e to the negative 40.5 vertical dash line 81. And when you do uncertainty, uh, remember, when you take a logarithm of something, the number of sig figs in the logarithm term is the number of decimal places in the answer. When you're going e to the x or 10 to the x, it's the opposite of that. The number of decimal places in the value that you're e to the xing is the number of sig figs. So we have one decimal place, we'll get one significant digit in our equilibrium constant. So I get two, one sig fig, 0.37, times 10 to the minus 18. Remember, equilibrium constants, I've seen 10 to the minus 40-ish, up to 10 to the 15th, 19th, 30th, they're huge range, huge range. And remember, K values that are really small like that are very reactant dominant hugely reactant dominant all right and you'll see uh well i'll do that on the next board where we can relate this the value of k the size of k and the value or the size and sign of delta g naught to tell you whether something at equilibrium is mostly products mostly reactants or a good mix of both so you hear my cat meowing let's round this then i'll pause it that's closer to two than to three so that round since i'm asking for it two times ten to the minus 18th, and equilibrium constants have no units. So let's look at a qualitative overview of all this mumbo-jumbo stuff, and uh, we'll be done with this particular video. Let me let my fat three-legged cat out. He wants more food. All right, guys, let's kind of summarize qualitatively. What does this all mean? Oh, my God. We'll talk about it first, and then we'll end it with some graphs. We like graphs. Graphs are nice ways to show a lot of information without being so wordy, like this board. All right, here we go. We've got our equation. That is one of the king kahunas, one of the top three, because it relates equilibrium to thermodynamics. Key, 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 key. Now, remember what we learned in, uh, boy, the very first thing we looked at almost in equilibrium was the, what does the size, the magnitude of the equilibrium constant mean? Remember, the equilibrium constant is product over reactants raised to the power of their stoichiometric coefficients. So if you have a very product dominant situation at equilibrium, mostly products, very few reactants, that's going to be a huge value of K, way bigger than one, right? Well, you know, 10 to the, the 15th, 10 to the 11th, 10 to the 8th range, you know, stuff like that, hugely positive exponents. Um, and if you've got really small K values, 10 to the minus 8th, 10 to the minus 15th, we've seen those, haven't we? That means you've hardly got any products at all. Your numerator is really small and you've got lots of reactants, so the denominator is huge. 
Um, so always keep that in mind. So let me write it over here. So K is roughly products over reactants. Keep that in mind. Law of mass action, right? Obviously raised to the power of the stoichiometric coefficients, but just keep, remember it's products over reactants. So really large K values are mostly products at equilibrium. Really small K values are mostly reactants at equilibrium. And K values closer to, the, closer to 1, you know, 10 to the 2, you know, 15, um, things like that, 0 0.1. Those are typically more equal amounts of reactants and products. What does that mean as far as uh, Gibbs, Gibbs energy changes at standard conditions? This is how we're going to do it. If your K value is tiny, 10 to the minus 8, you know, those kinds of things, that's a tiny, much less than 1, which means that's going to be negative, right? The log of a number less than 1 is negative, which cancels that negative sign. Do you see that? R is always positive, T is always positive. So K values way less than 1 will always give you a positive delta G. And the smaller K is, 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the minus 8 to 10 to the minus 11 to 10 to the minus 15, the larger your delta G is. And the bigger the delta G naught is, the more reactant favored this is at equilibrium, to the point where if you're like K is 10 to the minus 10th, it's almost all reactants, almost no products, right? So very, so you got this equilibrium, but very dominant on the reactant side. So very tiny K values, the smaller it is, the larger the delta G naught. And there's an interesting uh, table in your textbook you can look at that gives you roughly what delta G naught values are for K values. You can see that, and boy, it's, you know, it's logarithmically related, so, you know, it doesn't take a big change in delta G to cause a massive change in equilibrium constant values. I mean, huge, uh, you know, many orders of magnitude changes more than you would anticipate. All right. What if your K value is positive? Well, they're always positive. They're way bigger than 1. You know, 10 to the 8, 10 to the 15th type of stuff. Well, if K is bigger than 1, log of K, right, it will be a positive value. So that means delta G would be negative. So negative delta Gs, and the bigger K is, the bigger the delta G naught is, but on the negative side. And if it's negative, remember that's spontaneous in the forward direction, positive, spontaneous in the reverse direction, but K values that are huge are mostly product. So there's going to be heavily product favored. So large negative delta G naught values are very product favored. Large positive delta G values are very reactant favored. And then if you're in the middle ground, K values approaching 1 just means you've got very small delta G naught values. They could be positive or negative, right? If K is like a 0.1, you'd have a uh, positive delta G. If K is, uh, you know, a 2.5, it'd be a negative delta G, but still close to 1, which means you've got roughly equal amounts of reactants and products, right? Let's show you what that looks like graphically. I'll do one at a time. I don't think I can get all three on one board of these three scenarios. That'd be pretty, I, we'll see. I'll play with it. If not, I'll do one at a time. Right, you ready for some weirdness to end this off? So here's the first two cases where we got the extremes, extremely reactant dominated equilibrium versus extremely product dominated equilibrium. And you can look at that in terms of K equilibrium, or you can look at that in terms of delta G naught thermo. Some people prefer to think thermodynamically. Some people prefer to think equilibrium wise. I don't care. Prefer we both. All right. Here's the case where you got a very, very small K value, 10 to the minus 9, 10 to the minus 7, those kinds of things, 10 minus 16th, whatever. And again, the smaller that is, less than 1, the more positive and large. If it's less than 1, it'll be a positive delta G, but the more less than 1, the bigger the delta G. So let's take a look. Let's say this is a graph. you got your Gibbs energy on the y-axis. The extent of the reaction on the y-axis is more products, more reactants. If you're in the middle, that would be roughly equal amounts of both. So let's say our reactants start here, right? This is our reactants. This would be our products. Products are way higher energy than our reactants. So if you take the final state minus the initial state, that's going to be a huge, this is way bigger. That's going to be a hugely positive number, right? Bigger number minus smaller number <gasps> is positive. So that's a large positive delta G, which means we have a very, very tiny uh, K value, way less than 1. Can you see at equilibrium, equilibrium is the low point of this, right? Kind of like you, if you have a, a valley, a water will row toward, go towards the very bottom, or a ball will roll until it settles in the bottom. That's where nature likes to go. 
So boom, that's gonna be equilibrium. And do you see how that lies towards the reactant side? If reactants is here, products is here, you have mostly reactants here because your delta G naught is so positively big and your K is so tiny. You can see it's reactant dominant. Flip that on its head over here. Let's say we got huge K values bigger than one. One times 10 to the 15th, 10 to the 9th, those kinds of things. That's going to give us incredibly large delta G values, but negative, right? Which means it's going to be incredibly product favored. So let's say our reactants start here and our products end up over here. So woo, take the products, which are lower than the reactants. Products minus reactants is negative, and it's a big difference. So you get a very large negative delta G. That means you got a very large K value. That means you've got way more products than reactants. And you see where the equilibrium settles in right there? It's, there's more products on this side and more reactants on the other side. Right? And over here, you have more reactants on this side. Now, the next one, if K is close to 1, we're going to get an equilibrium point somewhere in the middle. Right? So the closer that K value is to 1, the smaller the delta G value is. So they're going to be closer to each other. And the more that bottom of that well lies in the center. So let me pop that last one on there. And we'll talk a little bit about Q versus K. Think about it from an uh, equilibrium perspective. All right, let's polish this off, gang. See if you can explain this one to yourself. I truly, when I looked at these three graphs, I had to read this several times. Because I was like, whoa, I got to think about this puppy. All right, so in this case, K is not really big or really small. And it could be positive or, you know, it could be a little bit less than one, greater than one, doesn't matter. Just that that's going to give us delta G values that are smaller. So in this case, let's say we've got a small delta G value. And take a look at here. So we've got, let's say our reactants are here. And our products are there. And in this case, the products are higher than the reactants. So if I take the products minus the reactants, I'm going to get this value, which would be a positive delta G, but it's a lot smaller versus the ones we had the other in the first two. We have really big delta G values, positive or negative. This time we have a very small delta G. And the smaller the delta G is, the closer the K value is to 1. And the closer the K value is to 1, and the smaller the delta G naught value, the more the equilibrium falls towards the center of the extent of reaction. Remember, the further to the right, the more products you have at equilibrium. The further to the left, the more reactants you have. So in the first two scenarios, we were way over here and way over here. Corresponding to K values of like 10 to the minus 10th here, 10 to the positive 10 there. Mostly products, 10 to minus 10 or higher. Mostly reactants, 10 to the, 10 to the positive 10 or higher is mostly products. 10 to the minus 10 is mostly reactants. That's kind of a give or take rule of thumb. 10 to the minus 10, 10 to the positive 10. So here we're at a K value closer to 1. So we're more towards the center. But since it's positive, delta G is positive, still not spontaneous in the forward direction, spontaneous in the reverse direction. So it's a little more favored for, for reactants at equilibrium, but still closer to the center, little bit more reactants and product, but not much. Now, if you look from a, a Q versus K perspective, let's do this in purple. What if we're not at equilibrium? Let's say we're up here. Q would be greater than K. Too many products, right? So if Q is greater than K, remember it shifts left. So it rolls down to equilibrium, adjusting the product and reacting concentrations until Q equals K. Then you're at equilibrium. Oh, what if Q is less than K? You don't have enough products, too many reactants. So it's going to roll down the hill, increase the products, decrease the reactants until Q equals K, and it hits equilibrium. Everything drives towards equilibrium. At equilibrium, delta G Del, not delta G, not delta G equals zero, right? Here, it's spontaneous in the forward direction, so delta G would be negative. Here, it's spontaneous in the reverse direction, delta G would be positive. Difference between, so delta G not gives you an idea of regardless of what temperature you're at um, or what conditions you're at, tells you whether you're going to be more product or reactant favored at equilibrium. Delta G will just tell you which way you're going to get there. Oh, that's enough of that.